the reason Jordan Peterson suits became so popular is not because Jordan Peterson's wearing them, because he's got lots of gray, black, and blue suits that aren't that popular. Let's say, like in the scheme of things, popular being that they draw attention, or let's say viral, be a better word. They're viral because I had no such commercial restriction in designing his wardrobe, because I was told right up front by his daughter, right up front, she was like, you will never tell anybody that you're making his suits, and nobody will ever know. And that's, and that's the social contract we're entering this with. And I said, that's fine. And so when I designed the suits, commercial, commercial viability was never a consideration. I just wanted him to like it. I just wanted it to be meaningful to him. And so maybe that didn't extend the full breadth of the creativity I might possess. I don't know, because there was still a restriction that he has to find it meaningful. But taking the commercialization away, let me explore my own creativity because I've never made suits like that before because our clients are lawyers and bankers and they wear gray and blue suits. Nobody wears two color suits or printed iconography suits or anything like that, right? Nobody. Nobody. So, so, so when people are like, oh, that's what your company does. I'm like, no, that's what I did for Jordan Peterson. That's not what my company does because I've never done it before. But I was allowed to explore the breadth of my own creativity. And he called me creative. And I was like, holy crap. And nobody's ever said that to me in my life. You find yourself creative? Man, I have such a crazy, I have a very hard time with that question. Why? Um, the first person, so, so I'll say this. So like, you know, like one, I think the reason you reached out to me is you guys saw my work and my company's work with George Peterson, right? Yeah, you're super. That's probably yeah, the, yeah. where the attention came from. And I, I, I'm going to say this, but I need to qualify it first. Like, I'm not like, best friends with Jordan Peterson. Like I, I know him. I've had three or four conversations with him for maybe 20, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, he's very busy. He's operating at a level I've never seen any other human being personally operate before. Obviously there's a intelligence there that's so profound that like every time he opens his mouth, it's like, you just want to listen and learn. So I'm not going to paint this like I'm best friends with him. But the couple of times that I've had a conversation with him face to face, like let's say three or four times, um, He's always said something that could, like just profoundly shifted my opinion of myself. And I don't know how intentional it was, but one of, he was really the first person that looked me in the eye and said, man, you are so creative. Hmm. Like nobody in my life had either mentioned that to me before or perhaps I didn't listen. And because of the profound respect I have for, for Dr. Peterson, I maybe listened for the first time. He said, you are so creative, you know, like. And, 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 and so the last time I saw him was last week in DC at a show and we're, you know, backstage just chatting. And I was like, you know, he was explaining why he loves this icon jacket that I made for him. The one that's like now being really associated with his brand. Like I designed that jacket. I sat on my computer and I told him, I said, so Jordan, you know, uh, you just described to me everything about this jacket that you love. And I didn't even know that when I made it, my, my idea was, you know, you told me you wanted something to represent sort of orthodox iconography. And so I, I researched it. I studied it you know, as much as I, as deep as I could go during work and after work. And I was reading about all these symbols and I'm like, okay, these are the things I want on this jacket. And then I put a jacket together with those images and you're telling me all these things I don't know. And then Jordan Peterson said, well, you know, Dimitri, uh, a lot of artists don't understand the art they create. That's normal. Okay. And that sent me off into like a basically an existential crisis. I was like, and I'll tell you crisis. why. Because, hmm. Basically. Yeah. Because as like an entrepreneur, well, first of all, let's go start sales. I'm like, I have a goal. I want to hit that goal. And here's the steps I need to take. And if I'm disciplined, I'll hit that goal. It's like bodybuilding. Like here's how much muscle I want to put on. You have somebody that's good that can explain how to do that. And then you work, you know, backwards on deconstructing it. And then you follow that, that plan. Yeah. And that's like sales. Like I have a goal. Let's hit it. And then entrepreneurship, it's like, I have to understand every aspect of my company, whether it's my, you know, cash flow statement or, or end of year tax filing or my, you know, per, per, per pack per transaction basket size or how many you know the velocity of transactions that we conduct in a month per salesperson like everything is is very structured and understood or at least you're always trying to bring things into order yeah i mean that's really how you grow businesses you bring things into order you understand what your key driving variables are and you bring them into order so everything sure. for me was very goal oriented even designing jordan peterson's wardrobe it's like i have a, a final outcome that i'm trying to pursue and here's so how i'm going to get to that outcome and then here he goes to me, he goes, you know, you don't need to understand your own art. And it completely removed the boundaries, right? And then I understood, I understood two things. Number one, my own vanity, because it's like everything I pursue has such a, um, everything I pursue is such an objective outcome that I'm looking at, like, like a goal-oriented outcome that brings me something back. But then that second thing that it helped me really discover is that 
my creativity has been completely limited by the fact, if let's say that creativity at all exists, it's been completely limited, limited by the fact that I'm so results orientated that if you drop me in a force with an axe, I'll just start chopping wood right away. Mm -hmm. Mean, you know, that's the conscientious aspect, but most artists that I've met, like it made sense to me. Finally, they're not very conscientious. They don't really care about the outcome. They're just trying to express what they want to express and put it out there. Whatever happens, happens, right? Yeah. They're responding and to so, the push that they feel. Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. And for me, that push that I feel, I'm like, how do I, how do I capitalize this push? Like, how do I monetize this? Right. And, and does it even fit within the framework of what I'm doing right now in, in the pursuit of the goals of the company? But him telling me that kind of made me realize, I'm like, crap, man, the reason Jordan Peterson suits became so popular is not because Jordan Peterson's wearing them because he's got lots of gray, black and blue suits that aren't that popular. Let's say like in the scheme of things, popular being that they draw attention or let's say viral, could be a better word. They're viral because I had no such commercial restriction in designing his wardrobe because I was told right up front by his daughter, right up front, she was like, you will never tell anybody that you're making his suits and nobody will ever know. And that's, and that's the social contract we're entering this with. And I said, that's fine. And so when I designed the suits, commercial, commercial viability was never a consideration. I just wanted him to like it. I just wanted it to be meaningful to him. And so maybe that didn't extend the full breadth of the creativity I might possess. I don't know, because there was still a restriction that he has to find it meaningful. But taking the commercialization away, let me explore my own creativity because I've never made suits like that before because our clients are lawyers and bankers and they wear gray and blue suits. Nobody wears two color suits or printed iconography suits or anything like that, right? Nobody. Nobody. So, so, so when people are like, oh, that's what your company does. I'm like, no, that's what I did for Jordan Peterson. That's not what my company does because I've never done it before. But I was allowed to explore the breadth of my own creativity. And he called me creative. And I was like, holy crap, maybe... And nobody's ever said that to me in my life. Yeah, and so I, I, I get all of it. I get all of it. Um, there's nothing there that I would possibly dispute, except I, I see, I see your creativity through the lens of a fellow entrepreneur. Like you, you saw, and now knowing your story, you saw an opportunity, and you met that opportunity with a push that you're trying to answer, and that opportunity was a hole through the veil. And that veil was in, I mean, in, in this case, that, that veil was the outer boundaries of the industry that you're in. So how, how do you make your slice out of this industry if the, the boundaries are this? Well, maybe I can extend the boundaries. Maybe I can change the boundaries. Or maybe I can just poke through it and find my slice. I mean, the entrepreneurs that I like to, I like to speak to I already went through that discovery process. Like we're not even talking about success here. We're talking about just seeing how to puncture through. Um, and you were actually brutally honest with me, which is what I also appreciate because we were talking about this when you were finding the opportunity. Uh, and you said you wanted to compete against unsophisticated competitors mm -hmm. in a sphere that wasn't regulated. I mean, you were, you, you, you were pretty forthright. What, what, made, what made you a little bit different in the industry at the beginning? Well, firstly, uh, the reason I wanted to com compete against unsophisticated competition was because I went to a pretty good business school. A lot of my friends ended up, you know, at PwC or went to Goldman Sachs or like had my other friends have like degrees in honors physics. I was just very, um, I, I, I was like ill confident, you know, like insecure because my friends were just so smart. My, my best friend at the time had skipped two grades of high school. My other really close friend had skipped one grade of high school. Both their parents on both sides had PhDs. <laughs> You know, and I'm coming in from like social housing as an immigrant. My parents were working class. And um, and so I think there was a, a profound insecurity that made me ask what, what my, my best friend at the time who had a summer internship at GS. And he, I was like, how do I compete against guys like you? Because like, I just I just feel like I, like I love that you guys are my friends. But I, honestly, I feel a little bit out of my league. And he was like, well, you can pursue this. You can go into some sales role, you know, in a big bank and you'll probably do fine competing against guys like that, or you can find a business that you can compete against artisans, he said, you know, uns unsophisticated artisans, whereas you're in it for the money, they're in it for the art. And I was because the, like, that's kind of in a way what Jordan Peterson said, like, you know, artists don't know the outcome of, or they don't understand their own art. Sure. He's like, you can compete against those people. And just, I'm like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm fairly quantitative in my thinking. Um, you know, I'm, I'm good with numbers. I understand that. And I know by that point, I can sell. So just it was just very cogent that I would go into an industry where I could sell something that I understand. Um, 
And, and how was I going to compete against those guys? Well, I was willing to, and this is the answer right here. I knew that I was willing to do things they weren't willing to do. Like I wasn't just going to open a store and sit around because it's not in my character to open a store and sit around. I'm going to pick up the phone and cold call and I'm going to get in front of people they can't. And my, my thing was like, and this might sound a little bit, um, in, you know, insidious. It wasn't meant like that. It was just a, a personal motivational thing. I was like, I'm going to put these other tailors out of business. Like when I show up in your town, watch out. Like when I show up, you know, you know so I was like, I'm going to, I was in Calgary when I started the company. I'm like, I am going to, you know, I would walk by some, some, some store and I'm not going to say any names. I was like, man, I'm going to take food out of your mouth today. That's literally like as a, as a, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, I'm going to take your clients. That's it, man. Like I just showed up to win. And my number one thing I would tell myself as a, as a, um, affirmation was I would hate to compete against myself. Hmm. Like I'm going to be the guy that competitors hate. Cause, and, and it happened. Like I started taking some pretty awesome clients, you know, guys, that are top CEOs and stuff. And once or twice during the first five or six years, some local tailor called me. He's like, well, you know, you don't even know what you're not even a tailor. You're just selling guys, blah, blah, blah. You know? And, and it's pretty funny because it's so petty that somebody would make that call. And, and when it happened, the first time I just said, look, man, you can hate me all you want. In 20 years, I'm still going to be here taking your clients. So maybe, maybe there was just like a very profound competitive streak that I learned about myself. And you have to be very competitive as an entrepreneur. Like you need a sure. bad guy to defeat. You just do. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Robert Herjavec talks about that in his book. Kevin O'Leary talks about that in his books. Like you see entrepreneurs have a very like even you saw Steve Jobs talk about it. Like entrepreneurs have a competitive streak. Of course. Right? And uh, and so and so what was driving that was was probably a little bit of just wanting to win a little bit of insecurity and an understanding that I'm willing to get my hands dirty. You know, a lot of my business came from one of my best clients ever. Uh, I would just walk up to him on the street. I was like, I really like your suit. And I'm going to guess you're a lawyer. And he's like, I am. How did you know? I said, you just, you have the aura, man. That's what I do for a living. I sell suits and I come to your office and I got his card and he became a huge client for me. And I sold everyone in his law firm. And that that's cold probably, call. That probably, that was a, that was yeah, a cold yeah, call. Yeah. Street, appro street approaching was a big part of my business. You know, again, you want to find a romantic story in a company that designed suits for Ozzy Osbourne. There's no romance here. It was just freaking doing things that others weren't. Well, I was riding elevator. I've been kicked out of every, every office tower in Canada, especially when I had rookies and I was training them. And we would just yeah. ride elevators and walk into offices to introduce ourselves until security kicked us out. Yeah, this is, I, I, I think I've said this before too on the podcast. It, it's too bad that we celebrate the final success. Like that, that needle point is what we like to celebrate. But, and, you know, and, and we, all, we always hear about the overtalk. It's the journey. It's the journey. But, I mean, it really is. The final point is not, it's not to be celebrated. What's to be celebrated is the resilience, right? It doesn't matter what you do in life. It's the resilience and the hard work and the grind. Now, the purpose behind it, and so, so I'm, I'm with you. Now, the purpose behind it, you said, I, I was in it to win. I was in it to, to beat the bad guys. Has that changed for you? That's a really good question. I think as I've gone older, A, my energy changed. Hmm. Like I tell guys all the time, what I did in my 20s and 30s, I'm 41 now. I would never be able to do that today. Like it, if I had to sell against 29-year-old, 28-year-old Dimitri, I would lose. <laughs> like that guy had a freaking chip on his shoulder, man, mm. you know, and I think a big part of, 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 um, of growing up in, and it probably being just placated by a little bit of that success, if you want to call it that, like it just, it just, it does, you know, the hunger, I can see that in athletes, right? Like a 41 year old boxer is not the same as a 29 year old boxer. Like it's just sure. a different level of hunger that exists. It's not just yep. physical. There's a different level of hunger. There's a ferocity because that's there. Yeah. For Ross, that's it. Like you're, you're just placated by a little bit of your own success. So, and I'm not trying to say that I'm ill motivated. I'm not. I think the other aspect of it is I just take greater pleasure now in the success of others within our company. And so, as I started to recruit and hire and develop people, I took a lot of pride in seeing the people that I was developing actually, in a lot of cases, starting to outperform me. I love it. I love that. You know, and I was like, wow, this feels very good because at some point, legacy starts to deeply matter, and that's. Probably my greatest driving uh, purpose today is I don't want to just be a company that made suits for Jordan Peterson and Alice Cooper. Like, I don't want that to be on my gravestone. You know, I, I think I think as you grow and you have an opportunity to change lives, you want to change lives. I want to see people in our organization grow, develop, build successful, brilliant careers. I have guys in my company now that have, you know, have wives and kids that they've built their entire careers on in our company. That's very profoundly meaningful, deeply meaningful to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want I mean, others. You're, you're, you're building a tree. So you're, if we're going to use legacy, your word, 
your legacy is the tree that you built, the tree that you yeah. planted, right? Many, many years ago. And those two, so your Jordan Peterson, your Alice Coopers, they're like little limbs on a branch of that tree. I, I'm not to diminish it, but I mean, that's what it is, right? When you're building the story. Again, that's the pinprick that people see, but it's the, this is, this is what's beautiful about the human story is that we are a plant. If we care about what we are and who we are and where we're going, we are that tree. That tree, you know that tree is big, but you know that that tree keeps growing every year. You can't see it, but it's growing and it's growing underground as much as it is above ground. And it's creating those connections and it's nurturing others and it's being nurtured and, and nourished by others. You don't see it, but it's happening. Mm. Well, I have to think too, like, you know, again, this is going to be very pragmatic, but like, I can only measure my leadership by, I won't see the culmination of my leadership. Like I'll be long dead and then either the company dies with me or it continues for many generations and becomes something that people talk about. Like a, like a Brioni, which is a great brand, you know, the, the founders aren't around, but man, everybody knows that brand. That's the one, you know, um, and, and this exists in different industries, of course.